So, I'm Nick Withers, uh, medical director. I think uh, Mona's already brought up the fact that I've uh, done 22 years in the military. And um, so that's why she was happy to get me on board to do a lot more organizing than anything else there. But now I work over in the emergency department here in Duncan, and it's been fantastic. We have, we're so lucky to have such a, a gem of a resource over here. I see some of the our nursing staff who've generously uh, volunteered their time, and lots of the family doctors that do amazing work. You ever, I live in Victoria, and I actually drive here because I love the Emerge so much, and I think it's such a great team and such a great medical community here that it's worth the extra 45 minutes because I could have been working in Victoria, and a lot of us do that because this is such a gem of a place. I just had to put that out there. So today we're going to talk uh, quickly about some recognition and initial uh, treatment or management of allergic reactions, or anaphylaxis. Start with a case. You have a 13-year-old male presents with facial flushing, rash, and vomiting after eating a sandwich. Uh, reports that he's going to pass out. So you see something like that. Maybe it was a bad bologna sandwich. I'm a newfie, so we love the big, thick uh, bologna sandwiches. Maybe it's bad bologna. Maybe, you know, we left it out in, in the sun all day. Who knows? Food poisoning. It's a big, broad differential diagnosis. There are a number of different causes here. But you probably know what it is because we're talking about anaphylaxis. Well, let's talk about some of the common causes. Big one, foods. What's number one? Peanuts, right? Peanuts. And it's hard to keep nuts out of every food and get cross contamination, so it's a big issue. Insect venom, right? We see lots of people who claim they have anaphylaxis to wasp stings or bee stings, right? It's almost as bad as the army of spiders that's running around biting people. And as the spider, spider bite, ah. Uh, then, of course, latex, medications, and then people who are getting shots in their doctor's offices to, against allergies, they sometimes have anaphylaxis as well. Little joke. <laughs> so, what is it? It's basically an acute allergic or hypersensitivity reaction. It's multi system, and that's key. It's because we see a lot of people, and I look at the docs, they know what I'm talking about. They, somebody gets a, a bee sting, and they come in, they got a big swollen place where they got bitten. Yeah, you got, you got stung. That's normal. It's supposed to swell up. That's your body's reaction to you know, foreign protein being injected. That's not anaphylaxis. It has defined triggers, and that's one of the things that we need to figure out is what are those triggers. And that can sometimes be very difficult. We see lots of patients who have anaphylaxis, and we don't even know what they're allergic to. It's very challenging. And last but not least, of course, it's potentially fatal. So that's why we take this serious, because if we can get treatment early, identify it early, then we can decrease those really tragic cases of death. So there's going to be a test on this at the end. If you can learn that quickly, that would be awesome. Because I phone a friend. Uh, you phone a friend, you better be really smart. Because uh, most of us doctors have forgotten that a long time ago, thankfully. And have inserted important things like wives, birthdays, children's names, that sort of thing. And the memory bank. So there's a series of diagnostic criteria. And this may be a little bit medical, but we'll break it down for those that maybe are first responders or uh, have uh, less training. But it's an acute onset of an illness within minutes to maybe an hour, a couple of hours, and it has, has skin or mucosal, so that means your skin or inside your mouth, your tongue, those sorts of uh, linings, and at least one of respiratory compromise. You refer to that, that can be a number of things. That can be a wheeze, it can be a cough, it can be, oh, I'm just having some difficulty breathing. Uh, or a reduced blood pressure, or signs that uh, basically the organs aren't working very well, okay? And particularly like your brain, if you're not getting blood pressure to your brain, you pass out and you get confused. So that's one diagnostic criteria. Most of us recognize that. So you get big hives and you have difficulty breathing, that's anaphylaxis. Number two uh, is if you have any two of the following. So again, hives, respiratory compromise, or reduced blood pressure. And the one that we don't think about is GI, or gastrointestinal symptoms. So some folks will get a rash, a hives, and then they'll get like abdominal cramping, or vomiting, or diarrhea. And I gotta be honest, I've probably miscalled that before. Um, not much in the last 10 years, I don't think, but I bet early in my career I missed it. But think about those gastrointestinal symptoms. So you can have that rash, and then you can have your diarrhea, and that's anaphylaxis. 
And this is the other third criteria, like the, just the way it's, you don't need to know, I just want to make sure that you understand the principle, that just reduce blood pressure after exposure to uh, some sort of uh, antigen or an allergen can also be that, uh, that cause. So for kids, they're really hard, right? Because infants don't talk. Uh, so you're trying to figure out what the hell. No, but I, we, we don't do blood pressures on them either because they freak out. So we're probably going to miss this one. But in adults or older kids, if you know blood pressure is less than 90 after exposure to something that we think they're allergic to or we know they're allergic to, uh, then that would be, okay, warning, we want to get that blood pressure up. So after working a uh, number of late evenings, I, uh, I can sort of sympathize with Snoopy. So how often do these things happen? So standard mucosal findings are most common. So that could be like hives, fancy name for that is urticaria, all right? So you see those hives are welts and they tend to move around. Uh, that's most common up to 90%. Respiratory, so people have difficulty breathing, wheezing, they might notice that they're coughing up more phlegm or gunk. That would be another one that's common. Gastrointestinal happens up to almost half the time, so 45% of the time. But it's not one that we often focus on. And then cardiovascular, in particular, low blood pressure. Because you get into a shock picture, right, with anaphylactic shock, where all the blood vessels open up and all your blood volume, instead of staying in the blood vessels and come back to your heart, starts to seep out into uh, the area of the interstitium, the area outside your blood vessels. And that obviously can be a, a major issue. Okay, so treatments. Here's what I see for most treatments is Benadryl. All right, and that's what I say, oh, I took my Benadryl, I'm good to go. Mm, okay, and then we used to do something called uh, epinephrine, where it's subcutaneous epinephrine, which would be just under the skin. We now know that that yeah, is probably not the best treatment in the world. In fact, it, it, it's not great at all. So really what we want, epi, epi, and uh, pretty much epi, okay? <laughs> Because if we give epinephrine, that's going to uh, reverse all the change or most of the changes associated with this shock. And but if you're in the field, what are you going to do? You know, may not have that be right away. They might have one dose. And if somebody's actually passing out, you can actually we call it an auto transfusion, or basically you give them back their own blood. You pick up their legs and dump all the blood that's in their legs back into the trunk, and that actually helps. It can help quite a bit. What do I do? Or our doctors here, because we all have the own little anaphylaxis kit. So we do go with epinephrine, but when we inject it, we inject it like an auto injector, right? Right into the muscle, because you get better absorption, more reliable absorption, if you go into the muscle as opposed to under the skin. Then Benadryl, we give it, because, oh yes. No, that's complete and utter bull. Uh, so you'll probably deal with Dr. Conrad. He's sometimes a bit weak. Um, so, uh, no, definitely upper outer thigh, okay? Put it, the key on that one though, as uh, my military training, we used to have other auto injectors for saving people from nerve agents and stuff. Once you push it in, you gotta leave it in for a while. Like five, 10 seconds for sure, because sometimes it gets injected slowly. And, you know, I pulled one out once, so it's in some training, and it like fired across the room, I'm like, ooh. <laughs> so, well, it was not a human. Uh, so anyways, yeah, so you no, know, you definitely want to use it. And in fact, yeah, you put a big muscle mass, keep it out there, and just leave it, go through clothes, we don't care. Pop it in there, and we'll be fine, we'll sort out everything after, because anaphylaxis is immediately life-threatening. If you get a little infection in your leg, yeah, we can sort that out, that's not a problem. So, Benadryl is good, go ahead, because it takes away the itchiness, that makes people feel better. But a lot of times we get a bit drowsy with it, so that can sometimes make it a little bit tough for us to know, particularly pre-hospital, whether their blood pressure is low, whether they're getting confused from the anaphylaxis, which is less likely or not, but take the Benadryl. Ranitidine blocks some of the histamine receptors as well. We use steroids, like, and not the ones that make you big and strong, but we use, uh, you know, uh, prednisone, those sorts of things, or solumedrol, just to cut some things down. People are having a lot of wheezing, then we'll give the inhaler, the blue inhaler, the ventolin, because that'll help open up the lungs, because they're getting bronchospasm, 
or muscle spasm in the lungs, and you want to open up those tubes and make sure that uh, people get uh, the, the oxygen in. And then we'll also give IV fluids, of course, if people their blood pressure is low, because we want to make sure that they, uh, their, full, their tank is full. Because what happens is when all those blood vessels get leaky, your tank becomes empty because all the fluid goes out into the tissues, not in the blood vessels. We need to fill up the blood vessels again. And so epinephrine, whoever created that system was insane, right? So in the emerge, you got this one in 10,000 and one in 1,000 and blah, blah, blah. blah. I, I don't keep track of it anymore. I don't care. I want to know what is the dose, okay? Is it a milligram? Is it a uh, half milligram? What are we going with here? For adults, generally, an EpiPen is 0.3, so 0 0.3 milligrams, but the recommendations are between 0.3 and 0.5, and you give every five to 15 minutes. For children, of course, they always make it difficult, uh, 0 0.01 milligrams per kilo, and EpiPen juniors are uh, 0 0.15 milligrams. If you only have a junior and you're dealing with an adult, still jam it in there, doesn't matter, you're gonna get something's better than nothing. And frankly, if I had a kid and I only had a, 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 uh, a senior dose, I'd probably just use that. Because the reality is, uh, kids' hearts can accept really high heart rates, right? They have to smoke and drink and they're doing all the stupid stuff we do. <laughs> they're all good to go, so you, they can run about 200 for a while, that'll be fine. <laughs> so, I don't know if you heard about this, but in the US, the same company, I think, that tried to charge like a billion dollars for another medication, they took the EpiPens and went from like, 80 bucks up to 500 because they could. God love America. I was going to show you a little uh, talk on how to use the EpiPen, but just look it up online. It's, uh, so if you're going to be going to a venue, we'll put this in, I'll say I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, we'll put it online so you can download it or a link to it. But uh, basically, it's, it's relatively simple, but there's some really good videos, like between two and four minutes, on, on YouTube, made by the makers of EpiPen. Very useful. One thing I want you to remember uh, or know, because you may not have heard of this, is that some people actually have a biphasic reaction. And what that means is that you get the initial anaphylaxis, and then you're good for a few hours, and then with up to even three days, you can get a second spike without being introduced to the allergen again. So it's a bit weird. You're like, mm, how does that happen? And we don't really know. He used to say that it was up to 20% would get biphasic. I got to say, and if I, I look at Isabel and, and Mike and, and the other dogs around, like, I don't know, 1%, 2%, 5%, I've never seen it. I've never seen any of my colleagues bounce back. It's a lot less than that. But uh, you just want to keep that in mind. And sometimes we'll actually use the prednisone medicine to try to decrease the rate of uh, my basic reaction. So if there's going to take three, because I know most times when you sit through a lecture like this, like you might get one, two, maybe three messages tops. That's it. So if there's three things, is one, don't forget that if you get anaphylaxis, can have GI, you can poop yourself, right? Or vomit. Keep that in mind. Number two, patients will die rash free with Benadryl. <laughs> All right? So epi is the key. They'll make a beautiful corpse. <laughs> so in a case study, of course, we got a 13-year-old male presented with facial flushing rash and vomiting after eating a sandwich. And I guess one of the more common things is that somebody with any allergies, if uh, these deli meats or the slicers, they get all cross-contaminated and everything because it's hard to clean them. And uh, that's what the uh, story was there, a little anaphylaxis. If you have any questions, please feel free to send it uh, to us. Um, my games one and zero, my director at bcsummergames.ca. Happy to answer any queries you might have if I can.